right, then uh, welcome to our first Roof talk of the day. Uh, please welcome with me Alex on a Roof intro and what's new in Roof. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, if technology works as we want. So, um, I'm Alexander. Uh, I'm a DevOps engineer at Cloudical. I'm one of the Rook maintainers and, well, certified Kubernetes administrator. Um, so, before I'm just jumping into the topics, quick point that you see on the rough outline on, on uh, what I'm going to talk about. First part, Kubernetes and storage. Just a quick point on how is it looking in Kubernetes, what's the situation, what is Rook, that you, well, get kind of a bit of... Uh, an overview on what even what is Rook even um, architecture, and then we're going to dive into the new features, also in the roadmap for the future. And just as a well, last point to throw in, we are uh, looking to graduate the project soon, so um, I'm going to talk about that in a bit as well. So Kubernetes and storage. Um, in Kubernetes, if you want storage, uh, you're well, basically bound to use uh, external storage, meaning, well, taking on-premise uh, on with bare metal as an example, you need to have some sort of storage already existing. Um, not to name any names, but, um, well, those bigger appliances for storage you might have. Um, well, if you're just on-premise, that might be already enough for you. But in general, with the storage there, it's not too portable. Um, meaning that if you go from on-premise and you're on the, um, the uh, multi-cloud, hybrid cloud kind of trip, <laughs> um, well, your appliance in, uh, in the data center might not be uh, sufficient for, well, your AWS or whatever cloud uh, scenario. So, um, well, as we have it, if, you're, if your appliance is in the basement and not in the AWS cloud or GCP, wherever, well, you need to have access to the services. Um, that's not too much of a challenge if you're just on-premise, but, well, um, but it's, it's in general just like a, it's not too portable unless you are in the same environment all the time. Um, for if you're more or less in a cloud environment, the problem that arises is, um, well, you're kind of locked in. Because if you're uh, with AWS, well, you can use their EBS and their, well, their file system and, well, S3 and so on. At least S3 is a bit more open, if you will so, so that's not too much of a problem, but normal, well, classic storage like block and file system storage is kind of a burden to have, um, well, switching from environments. Even though, uh, as we have in Kubernetes storage classes and such, which kind of are, well, a bit of an abstraction there, um, well, it's still a bit of a challenge because if you have a, a bug on, well, on, let's say, your local appliance storage and you move it to AWS and you don't have the bug there, well, there are certain scenarios where it's simply a bit more important to have the same storage from your on-premise or whatever to full production, so now. Yeah. And another point, um, well, if you're a big company, you probably don't have to too much as a problem. Um, you need to have someone that manages the storage. So if you just put some appliance in and while well, it runs, then, well, you might not need to manage it too much, but still, at least it feels a bit weird to just put in some appliance and yeah, it runs, it runs, and it runs till it doesn't run, yeah, well. Uh, um, so, kind of the question there, who's managing the storage? So, um, that's where we come to what is Rook. Um, Rook is, well, a storage operator. Um, the part of the operator part, I'm going to go into that concept a bit further later on. The part of operator is simply as it kind of implies. Well, I'm, for example, an operator to, well, operate, um, well, some, some crane or something. It's kind of the same if you think uh, for Rook there. It's, well, operating uh, things like Ceph 
EdgeFS and other storage systems, storage software, backends, providers, how you want, name it. Um, and the point with Rook there is that it, well, you have Kubernetes, oh, well, fine, put Rook on it, you have Ceph, for example, or EdgeFS. So it's um, generally not just about Ceph there, it's general point of um, those, well, complex uh, storage systems, um, making them easy to run in your Kubernetes cluster. So, well, in containers in the end. Um, and a part of where, well, where the Rook part with the operations is coming in is, um, it's, it's trying to have it as abstract as possible, but with also a good amount of customizability either way for the users, where Rook takes care of deploying, uh, managing, installation, configuration, all those hundred steps, and well, in the end, you create one, two more objects to talk about the Kubernetes part there, and bam, Ceph cluster in your Kubernetes cluster, ready to be used by the applications. Well, if you want to bring that to production, there's a bit more to think about like, what's kind of distance on, but well, kind of, if you think about more on a lower level. Still, remains that Rook will take care as good as possible about those points for a storage uh, software. Um, but, well, let's kind of step a bit back there. Rook, it's open source, Apache 2.0 license. We are uh, a project of the CNCF. We currently, that's also later on, as I said, uh, we are looking to graduate the project as, um, as um, other projects like Kubernetes, Prometheus as well, have already done graduating from CNCF, so we're trying to do that as well. Um, as we had with the operator part, um, to make it easily possible in Kubernetes, we can introduce so-called custom resource definitions. Um, those are basically, well, a possibility for users, especially more, well, administrators of the cluster, to extend the Kubernetes API. So, well, for Rook, looking at Ceph there, we would, for example, have a Ceph cluster object. For, well, other purposes, like, well, um, MySQL, for example, you might want to have like a MySQL database or something object, which um, especially looking at, um, well, user experience for the developers, if they need a database, well, go ahead, create your MySQL database object and some operator in the end will take care of creating all the things needed for the database. It's the same concept there for Rook. The admin, hopefully not just all the users on the cluster, um, creates a, a Ceph cluster object, and based on the specifications in that object, Rook will take care of, um, well, for example, for Ceph to create OSDs from the disks in the servers, will discover them, and, uh, well, create the, um, no, create the command structures and all needed uh, to, for example, then tell Ceph volume to use those and those disks based on these specifications. Um, yeah. I already mentioned that it's not just about Ceph. It's also about other storage, which, well, is, yeah, well, complicated to run. Um, Ceph, CockroachDB, EdgeFS, uh, Cassandra, NFS, YugabyteDB. Um, kind of shout out to the YugabyteDB people. They just uh, joined with, like, version 1.1. <laughs> um, great people. And, yeah. The idea is to grow that even further. So it's not just as like Ceph or something. The idea is that uh, in a broader sense, well, I have my own premise, for example, I create my Ceph cluster using the root Ceph operator, and oh well, I need a, I need a, well, Yugabyte DB. And I create it and just, for example, tell it to use as normal Kubernetes flow to claim, persistent volume claims as a keyword there, uh, the storage, for example, from the Ceph cluster, because why not? Um, so yeah, going to the architecture. There's in itself three layers. You have the operator layer. It's well managing the staff, it's configuring it, but the main point to mention, it's not on the data path. So there's no, well, my one operator pod right now is down, so oh no, everything's halting, IO is stopped, and that's not gonna happen. Um, for the storage provisioning, thankfully, through the CSI, the Container Storage Interface, 
it's well, <laughs> it's amazing, as it's uh, not just um, well for there was something previously. Don't remember, like uh, don't. Um, well, it's not too important. It's flex volume. Point is with CSI, it's more like a common solution for general storage. It has container storage interface as a name, but it's general interface to more or less be able to say, hey, give me 50 gigs of storage, and then on a node to say, hey, please mount the storage, for example. Uh, and that's great, as previously we had written our own flex volume driver, and well, it's a pain to maintain such a driver. So, <laughs> but it's also for, it's not just for the SAF part, it's also for HFS, for example, as they're also providing block storage and file system storage. Rook takes care of setting up the CSI driver as good as it can. So like there's definitely some points where, well, the admin needs to step in to create storage classes to maybe, well, have certain changes, certain security uh, um, levels specified in the storage class or something. But main point is that Rook will normally uh, get you, for example, Ceph, Edge of his cluster in a state where you just need to create a storage class. So, yeah. So, um, as previously said for the operator, the operator is not on the data path. So, no need to worry about operator crashing or anything, or being incompatible. Um, it's just Ceph or HFS or Cassandra and so on. There's, well, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I mentioned uh, previously like Rook Ceph operator, and there's even Rook HFS operator and so on, the point there is that it's separate operator. It is not like, yeah, I want to use Ceph, but because I install Rook, I have the Rook Ceph operator, HFS, and then and so on operator. That's not like it. That's the reason why it's split like that. If you want Ceph, well, go for the Ceph operator. If you want, let's say, Cassandra as an example, you use the Cassandra operator. So you have the freedom there to kind of say what you need and what you want. So, yeah, well, as I said, we have the Rook operators um, that do the management, configuration, upgrades, and stuff of the software um, from, <coughs> from uh, as previously said, with like the operators. And it's basically the same. The operator is simply, well, automating certain actions which normally a human would need to do, or, well, maybe even another automation tool, um, like, well, Ansible or something. So. Um, yeah. Um, coming back to the custom object, um, if you create a Ceph cluster and say, hey, I want to use, for example, well, my SDB drive or something, or maybe my, well, you add, to, uh, add a new disk in that uh, definition and say, well, use my SDC disk as well. The Rook operator uh, will take care based on that and, uh, well, will see, okay, the state changed and act on that, will trigger all the things needed all the preparation jobs, for example, for the OSDs, and you will hopefully in a few, well, let it be a minute. Some, sometimes LVM and so on takes a bit of time, uh, at least for Ceph, the volume part there. Um, but yeah, so in the end, operator watching over everything, seeing, oh, state changed, I need to do something, and even kind of like uh, health checking to a certain point, where it's like, oh, we can't upgrade now because the status of the Ceph cluster right now says we have data, uh, well, OSDs down or something like that, too many or so. So um, there's parts where the operator kind of tries to also throw in a good amount of knowledge from the people that run Ceph cluster or even, the, well, more or less also the developer uh, of Ceph, um, where, for example, there's like a, um, what is it called? Ceph save to stop, I think, and save to remove command and such. And that's parts where Rook also tries to, um, we are more and more also moving there uh, to use the Ceph native uh, parts to, um, well, um, have the cluster operate as safe as possibly. Um, so from the root part, um, operator part again, which is simply is the Kubernetes API. There's not too much magic involved. It's just normal power of Kubernetes. Um, Nothing, well, too special there to say. Um, as I said, it's managing upgrades and such. It's trying to do them as already for like Ceph and so on as, well, stateful if you want. Um, yeah. 
So, um, coming back to the customer service definitions. Uh, so, we have those customer service definitions, and in those, the admin specifies what they want. They can, they can specify one device after another. They can even, if they're, well, in an AWS environment or, well, in a cloud environment in general, they can even specify that storage should be uh, taken from, like, the cloud provider and such through, again, like, standard Kubernetes methods, persistent volume claims and such, and, well, just a normal way of kind of doing it. And the object is basically, in the end, as Kubernetes wants it, it's the state as it's desired. So there's not, it's, the root operator will try as long as possible uh, to use the disk even if it doesn't exist. Or, well, it, there's mechanisms in play to hopefully prevent that, but just from a, um, just from a um, Kubernetes standpoint, if the uh, object says, hey, use this disk, it would technically, well, try forever because the user wants to decide state to use this disk, so, no. So, uh, moving on to the new features. You get a, you go by DB joint in 1.1. We're already at Rook release uh, 1.2, but, well, yay, new storage backend. Um, same goes here. We are well, a perfect example right now for the CRD part, the customer sources. We can define our own objects or even, well, own APIs. And the people that create those CRDs can basically put in whatever they want and even have, uh, which is pretty powerful about Kubernetes, have validation and such in place. Um, HFS. <clears throat> HFS has uh, been able, thanks to Giovanni Isa Must I think I'm buttering the name, uh, Mustafa, um, um, has implemented multi-home network. That's a big challenge a bit still in uh, Kubernetes. I can tell you, at least just from general concept there, for the well for the um, for projects such as Multis. Um, if anyone has maybe heard about Multis yet. Um, the idea is simply to have, again, Kubernetes native custom resources and such uh, to be, um, to easily like be able to have multiple interfaces from the node, but even virtual, well, overlay networks and such um, per application, per pod running in your Kubernetes cluster. Um, he, well, he didn't just design it, he <laughs> even implemented it. That's great, that's cool to see. Um, just kind of quick look here for um, the again part. We just specify a new part of configuration. In this case, I think there's even not just support for multis, but I can't get the name right now, but in the, the, in one of the other projects that's uh, allowing custom networking stuff in Kubernetes and easily um, configure those networks to be used for, these, for this HFS cluster in this case. Um, for Ceph, I think a lot of a lot of people, including me, um, well, have been kind of desperate for this feature. Um, partitions, finally, at least to kind of uh, bring up what my case is. Um, maybe who knows Hetznap hosting provider? Anyone? Maybe? Oh, well, uh, they have cheap servers, and you but you have two disks most of the time. And those disks are most of them like four terabytes, eight terabytes or something big. And if I have my OS on one of them, I basically lose the whole disk because previously I couldn't use a partition, which, well, I would 100 gigs maybe for the OS and the rest for Ceph, because why not? And finally, I think the, uh, yeah, since, uh, well, with the upcoming, I'm, I'm not sure if it's already out, the 14.28 release though, that is available uh, as a feature to use. Um, yeah, it's, it's great to see. It's awesome. <laughs> so big thanks for everyone that's contributing, helping, being on the Slack. Just, well, also thanks for being here. Um, yeah. So for the roadmap, well, we just try to further stabilize uh, the customer source definitions, try not to, well, change them too much as we are <laughs> on a stable level uh, for, uh, Ceph and HFS, for example, right now. Um, we, well, we try to use, we have, well, we have our own code. 
that does like the watching on the custom objects and such. Um, well, it's uh, well. There's a bunch of other projects out there as well, um, which kind of offer a more well more commonly used um, approach to doing that, like the operator SDK uh, from Red Hat Chorus. I think those two com projects slash companies. Um, so the idea is to well move away from our own stuff and get something which well everybody uses uh, and yeah um, as we had it with Yugabyte DB joining for 1.1 we hope to get more storage providers on board with Rook uh, for Ceph I talked about the multi hump network stuff for HFS um, well it's soon also coming to Ceph in I think let me ah. In where do we have it? It's planned for around 1.3, thanks to uh, Sebastian Hahn again. Um, yeah, let me go back on the slide here. Um, and for Ceph parts, the uh, manager part. Who knows about the Ceph manager? Who knows about the Ceph manager dashboard? Hmm? Ah, well, um, the idea there is there's a cool dashboard where everybody is working on. Um, to, in general, have better integration with such orchestration tools like, well, the deep sea stuff and so on, like the existing, well, Rook also exists, but, um, but also for Rook side to even also better integrate it with that. That's uh, one of the ideas, Daniel, is that you can specify everything you want in the Ceph cluster object. Um, but if you want, you can also just log into the dashboard, see how, which disks are available in each node, and then just click, click, and say, yeah, well, make them OSDs or something. And, well, we, we, we want to get there. <laughs> We're not quite there yet, but it's getting better and better. Uh, for HFS, they simply want to feature, um, well, to support new features that they have implemented in the project themselves. Um, and one of the bigger parts here definitely is the CNCF project grad uh, graduation. Um, but besides that, there's more to come. So we, uh, we saw that project graduation. Um, I'm not going <laughs> to bore you too much with dates or anything. Point being, we joined uh, the CNCF project as a sandbox project in like 2018 or something. Um, and well, we further improved and stuff and woo. Point being, we we'll try to graduate in 2020. So hopefully around, around well, March. Um, and well, besides looking from the past to uh, now, well, a lot of numbers have increased, so that should probably mean something good, right? Um, it's growing. To summarize that slide, it's, we're, Rook is growing further and further. Uh, we have done also, which is for a good amount of companies, also very important. There was a security audit about Rook, uh, well, an independent security audit, um, was performed by the Trail of Bits guys. Um, they even did the Kubernetes security audit. Point being, there were some uh, vulnerabilities. We fixed them, or was well, one or two small, like. Well, not two critical things which are still being fixed. Point is, we got a security audit. It looks good. We didn't have too many critical things. Um, in general, just like the current fracture stuff, we need to improve a bit on the CI part and such. And well, so should you run Rook already? Who, who's running Rook in development or so, testing around, playing with it? Okay, who is running it in production? Uh, oh well, <laughs> at least a few hands. I'm happy about that. Um, uh, if you want, like, I would really encourage you uh, to uh, get in touch with me, maybe now, or you can also just um, no, uh, send Jared Watts a message on Slack or on Twitter, um, and well, kind of talk to him that we get a bit more. Um, um, no, what is it called? Not customer t testimonials, but testimonials about people using the project and, uh, well, using, well, using it simply. <laughs> um, yeah. And, well, for people that might not be able to say, hey, yeah, we're using it, it can also be confidential. So, well, 
Um, well, uh, I'm working for Cloudicle just as a sh point. If you want to work on Rook, like to program Go or something, feel, re feel free to reach out to us or to me. Um, but now, getting back to Rook. If you want to get involved, feel free to jump on our Slack. Rook.io is also a great place in regards to the documentation and such. Um, Twitter, we even have a mailing list. Uh, we have community meetings. So feel free to join. And yeah, uh, you got the photo? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> cool. um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them now. I'll try to repeat them as we will. <laughs> Some audio issues. Yeah? Uh, so the question is that there is an issue about extending persistent volumes slash persistent volume claims uh, with Ceph CSI, right? Yes. yes. Um, that is solved. <laughs> well, it's, n it's, it's solved in master to be that guy, uh, but it's backported as far as I know to 1.2 something, 1.22 or yeah, it, it is in 1.2 as far as I know, but not released yet, or it is already in the latest patch release. Point being, Ceph CSI, which brought this feature, which is the for them the 2.00 release, has brought this feature finally. Um, probably worth checking out github.com slash Ceph slash Ceph minus CSI. I hope they've updated their uh, feature table below. Um, Um, so the question is, is it possible to use multiple, well, Rook storage operators, for example, Rook Ceph and Rook HFS in the same cluster? Um, well, technically speaking, yeah, sure. That's not a problem. They're in itself independent. Um, well, if you use the same disk for both, there are, is a chance that, you know, one might uh, take a disk first before the other or something. But, well, it's... Um, you have two people fighting over the same disk, for example, then it's not a clash of the operators because they don't know about each other, but just a clash of the if disk on the servers. Yeah, yeah, if you separate like what nodes uh, they use, uh, then it shouldn't be too much of a prop. Yeah, it's like the same with if you use Ceph and the Cassandra one, you don't, you don't need to use the Ceph one. In the end, it's just normal piston volume claim storage. And if you separate and so it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. All backup and recovery from phase five. Uh, yeah. So how is currently the rook operator in this sense, and how is it evolving? Um, so the question is, uh, well, let me try to summarize it. Um, how far rook operator, rook operators will go in regards to second day operations, right? Um, well, one of the main parts there, at least, is already covered by the operators. For example, for Ceph. Uh, that's well the most common I know there is the uh, health checking of the monitors um, Because well you don't want to lose your quorum. I don't, well <laughs> um, Bad things will happen there um, In regards to backups of volumes and such uh, That's not a thing Rook is looking too much into simply due to the fact there's already a big ecosystem around it like uh, let me, where do we have it? Uh, from Stash project, the Stash operator, or well, it's even an operator which has CRDs as well. Um, there is Hapti.io, or it, well, it was previously, I think it's VMware or something now, with their Arc project. I hope they didn't rename it as well. Valero, mm -hmm. yeah, Valero yeah, the new name. Um, and there's a few more projects, uh, some even more on the Ceph layer, if you want for Ceph, for example, like Becky2, I think. Um, it's it's secondary operations, but it's something just due to the, the diversity there uh, in, do you want it in Kubernetes, fancy with customer resource definitions or more outside, just back up everything, for example. Well, and at least one phrase that's kind of stuck with me from some people that uh, 
<laughs> do a bit more in regards to Ceph um, is um, if you want to back up a Ceph cluster, put another Ceph cluster besides it. And it's like, well, uh, uh -huh. yeah. Uh, yeah? Uh, how do you integration? Um, so, add a, so you mean if you want to add a new storage backend, basically? Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, um, um, what do you need to do basically to add a new storage provider? Um, well, we have. We, well, we're trying to improve that even further now. <laughs> um, the main idea is that um, we have a lot of, uh, well, framework-like structures, to call it like that. It's not yet at a, f well, I would say, full-blown framework for that. But there's basically certain structures already available where you, well, you design your uh, uh, customer source definition. And, well, to put it like that, you can copy and paste certain parts of the code uh, where, which, for example, just do the easy part of watching and notifying your own functions then to, well, on ads, like a new object has been created, you react to it and such. Um, there's a good amount of functions already available. It can be still improved, like I said. Um, it's more like we're moving more and more to be a framework in that regard. Um, yeah. Okay, any other? Ah. Um, so the question is, if one... Rook Ceph installation can support multiple clusters. Um, to a certain extent, yes. You would um, have, let's assume the following. You have one cluster with the Rook Ceph on it, uh, and you have, let's say, three other clusters, uh, three other Kubernetes clusters. Um, you would use Rook Ceph just as normal in the uh, first cluster to get Ceph running, and in the other three clusters, you could also use uh, Rook there to, um, with the, um, uh, forgot the name, ah, external cluster integration, where um, you would um, take the access key and such from a disk cluster, give it to each cluster, and th then the root Ceph operator can also set up the certain things like Ceph CSI and such. Though one important thing there to mention is the root Ceph cluster in the cluster, you need to run it with host network true as of right now. Because the other nodes and such, they uh, need to be able to access the OSDs and the mods and like, well, everything in the end. So um, that's one of the kind of restrictions as we have right now. Yeah. If you don't have any questions uh, anymore, well, I got a few stickers still with me. So uh, feel free to grab them. So, yeah. Thank you.